Now, a cancer diagnosis can change anyone's life drastically. Our guest today, though, her story will inspire you, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So welcome to Unscripted with me, Grace Salame from the lovely Steakout restaurant on Manyani Road here in Lavington, Karibu. Welcome to the show. As always, thank you so much for making time for us. With us today is this lovely lady. You look very nice, by the way. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We can start off by introducing yourselves to people at home, telling them who you are and why you're here today. My name is Usna Living, and okay. I'm a cancer survivor. Fantastic. Yes. I guess that's it. That's all I need to say. You are a <laughs> cancer survivor. That is huge. Take us back, if you could, to when life took a drastic turn. This is back in 2019. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. So I had moved back home. Okay. Yes. Okay. I moved back to my mom's house. Okay. And I love working out a lot. Okay. So there I was, yes, doing my usual planks. Then I felt a sharp pain okay. in my chest. Okay. It used to come and go. And a few years before that, mm -hmm. in 2017, I had a chest pain. Then when I went to see the doctor, mm. he told me that I was suffering from depression. Yes. So I... Are you going to say like a cough or a bad infection? <laughs> he said depression. Yes. Because hmm. we did x-rays and there was, oh, was nothing clear. wrong. I see. Yeah. And he said it must have been depression. Wow. Yes. So and were you in a state of depression at that point? No, really. I okay. feel like I had normal stress levels like any other 24-year-old. Okay. By then I was 22. So okay. it was just normal stress levels. Okay. So for me, I didn't really understand it. But mm. then I went deeper and tried to read on what is depression. That's when uh. I came across the DSM-5 and trying to understand what is depression and what is going on in my mind. Got it. So in 2019, the chest pain came back and that's when I felt like there was something wrong. Mm. And a few days later, it got so excruciating that I couldn't walk. Really? Any step I took, it Affected was so painful. Chest. Yes. What? So I went to our local level five hospital. Okay. They did an x-ray. And then um, it was four in the evening and in our hospitals at that time, people were going to their homes. Yeah. So the doctor told me, just come back tomorrow. Mm. We'll take a look at the x-ray. But then I took the x-ray and went to this private clinic. Okay, good. And then the guy there looked at the x-ray and said, are you sure this is yours? I said, oh. yes. What did it show? Yeah, it, there was some curve. It's like something was pushing my ribs. And I said, this x-ray is not normal. I, I don't think you should be standing here. There's something wrong with your heart. Your heart is bigger. And he did some tests and he realized your heart is okay. But you need to book a vehicle and go to Nairobi. Okay. You need to do it. Or you see... Uh, so you're back home, like up country? Yes. I see. Yes. So you had to come to Nairobi now? Mm -hmm. I had okay. to come to Nairobi to see a chest specialist. Okay. So we made a few calls and then we booked one at Lancet. Got it. Mm -hmm. And after that, the chest specialist looked at it and he said, definitely there, there's something wrong. It looks mm. like there's a growth mm. in between your lungs and heart. There's something mm. wrong. There's something that has just fallen here, uh -huh. but you need to do a biopsy. That's when you can figure out what's here. Uh -huh. He didn't say, the, he, my he, sister used to call it the C word. He didn't, he didn't want to use yes, the C word. He didn't want to use the C word mm -hmm. because he but had already seen... just by saying biopsy, sort of in, insinuating, yes. that's yes. what he's thinking. Yes, uh -huh. yes. My family was all over the place. I'm we sure. went for the biopsy at Karen Hospital. Okay. After around two days, Dr. Muluka did the biopsy. And he didn't, give the, he didn't give me the results. He just told me, I will tell you when, you when we have that printout. I can't just tell you what I've seen. Okay. That's not what we are supposed to do. Yeah. So we had to wait for two weeks. And in this period of two weeks, are you in pain? Are you struggling? Are they treating you? What's I happening? Was. Yeah. I was because I was scared. Mm. I had started having the idea that I think this, this might be cancer. And you couldn't even finish that word. I know. Because cancer, cancer is, is an alien like disease. Mm. It's not a disease that's home. Yeah. It's a disease that you see on TV mm. or on the magazines. Yeah. You don't imagine, imagine yes, that, this that could you, be. Could, you could go through it. Yeah. So it was a very weird period in my family. I'm sure. Yes. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. Yeah. These chest pains used to come when I'm stressed. Oh. Yes. If I'm going through anything emotionally, that's when I used to get the chest pains. Yeah. So when I was diagnosed and having those chest pains were running up and down, mm. I said, wait a minute. Mm. I had read about this. If you are stressed, 
your immune system is compromised in some sort of way and the symptoms can now be same more and I said maybe on some level I might be doing this to myself yes I'm sick yeah but then there's nothing we can do until yeah. the two weeks are over until we get the results there's nothing I can do I so what I need to do is to take care of my mind uh -huh. and realize that no matter what happens yeah everything will be okay in some sort of way. Oh, wow. So you encouraged yourself in those two weeks I to did. try and stay positive. Mm -hmm. I, see. I remember we have a friend who is a radiologist. Uh -huh. She called us yeah. and when she had me speak, she told my sister, I think Usna is in denial. <laughs> yeah, that's not normal. That's not how people respond. Respond. Yeah. yeah. I think she might be in denial, but I wasn't. Okay. I really knew that if the cancer is there, there is nothing you can do. You can't mm. pull your hair out for it to disappear. That's true. You have to calm your mind and go through the treatment. That's very strong of you. Yeah. So when you did discover, okay, when were you given the diagnosis? Two weeks have come, you meet the doctor. Mm -hmm. How did you break the news to you? Well, my biopsy was done at Karen, mm -hmm. but I was sent from Coptic. So I, I just opened and saw Hodgkin's lymphoma. Did you know what that is? Had you ever heard of that? No, but I, I you googled. Google. Yeah, I just took out my phone. age you live in, Google is yeah, always I there. Yeah, I just took out my phone and typed Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was like, ha, huh, okay. I went to the parking lot. My sister was there. She saw me smiling and said, oh, I'm sure everything is okay. It depends on what okay means to you. Perspective, yeah. Yeah. Then she told me, I'm sure it's not cancer. I said, well, it kind of is. Wow. Yeah. As you're speaking, I feel like it was more of <gasps> for your family than for you. Than for me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm How the last so? born. We are eight. Wow. Yeah, so I think to them, I'm this little baby, baby that they took care of yeah. and they couldn't imagine such a thing happening to me. I remember at that time, I had graduated a year before, which meant I had no money. I had no millions mm. to take care of my treatment. treatment. They had to do that. So what was the next following steps after that? Well, when we received the news, mm. so we sat down and of course people, people's brains are all over the place. Mm. But I have one of my sisters who is a very practical and logical thinker. Okay. So as people Sometimes were you emotional, need that when yes, everything is all up yes. in the air. <laughs> so when people's uh, emotions were all over the place, mm. her mind was, uh, we need to look for a doctor. We need to, to look for a doctor ASAP who can tell us what to do. Okay. And I have my brother-in-law who works at Camry and he told us he had a friend who dealt with cancer patients okay. and he could help us out. Advice. Yes. Okay. But after we went there, my, like a week or so, my logical thinking sister thought, well, people get treated here. Mm. Then after it gets bad, they go to India. Let's start from so your sister India. said, let's just go straight yes, to India. Yes, let's, let's start straight from India. I feel like it's so unfortunate that we have to say that about our country. I oh, don't no. really desire to be in a place where you feel like you can get the treatment you need yeah. and require here. Yes. That speaks volumes. It does, yeah. it does. And if it weren't for my doctors here in Kenya, I wouldn't have known that I was mm. sick. That's true. Yes. That's true. But I feel like it's because of... Due to the experiences we've had, so mm. many people we hear like they got to this stage, then they left for India, then yeah. they left for India. So yeah. in some way you think that India is better. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't really mean so. I have yeah. so many friends who were treated here okay. and they're okay. Got it. Yeah. So how was your experience in India? So you had to go for nine months. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the treatment and why that period and how was it? <laughs> I got to the India, journey too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Very upbeat about life. Really? And I was excited. Really? Aha. Uh -huh. I had carried some of my psychology books from the library back at home okay. and my bag. When I got there, mm -hmm. I think uh, reality slowly started setting in. We lived in a compound where we were almost 20 patients. Okay. And most of them were Kenyans. Mm. And you get little kids, babies mothers who brought their kids there they tell you we've been here for seven months we've been here for a year yes people have been told you have two months to leave mm. yes you know i i think when you have cancer alone in the house you feel like i can be you can beat this yeah i can beat this but then when you get there mm. and you are in that ward waiting for 
the treatment regimen protocol, you're looking at all these patients with tubes mm. through their noses yeah. and you realize, wait a minute, <laughs> this is real. It's real. Yeah. It is real. It's real. Yeah. What is most difficult about the treatment? You did chemo treatment. I did. Tell us about that. So I had 12 rounds of chemotherapy. And when they said 12, I thought, ah, this is going to be easy, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't sound like much. Yeah, it doesn't sound like much. Yeah. And then, but before getting cancer, you used to think that chemo are like these fumes in a room. Mm -hmm. You don't imagine that it's a, a drip. Yeah. It's just a drip okay. coming through. But my first treatment yeah. was actually the hardest. Really? I sat for eight hours. Uh -huh. That medication has to come out yeah. in, in maybe doses. two hours, three hours, in very, very small doses. Mm. They can't just open it. Because your body be able to handle yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It comes in very small doses, and I had four packets of those. So they had to be pouches, rather. They had to be finished within the eight hours. What? So when I received the first chemo, I remember they put the, are they called catheters? Yeah. Yes, here. And I started passing, and I felt like someone was literally holding a burning candle or matchstick on my veins. I just screamed and told her, what, what is going what is on? What, what is that? Ouch. And she said, then your veins cannot take chemo normally. But since it has already started going in, you have to sit for today's session. On that note, let's take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, Usta, before the break, you were just detailing or describing to us what the chemo treatment was like. Mm -hmm. So your veins didn't handle the treatment well. Mm -hmm. But because you began, you had to proceed. I had to proceed. So you had to go through that excruciating, mm -hmm. almost piercing pain for mm -hmm. eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I, my caregiver was my brother. And I remember him rubbing my back and oh. just telling me, okay, we are almost done. It's the second one. Okay, this is the third one. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. So how would the neck, because your veins didn't respond well, how were you to take them again? How were they meant to be I had to put in something uh, called pot or a peak line. Okay. See, a pot is 100K mm. and you're just beginning treatment. You can't just splash 100K on comfort I'm telling when there's you. something cheaper. Yeah. So a peak line was 18,000 rupees. Okay. Yeah, so I put a peak line, and these are the marks I still have from the peak line. Oh. So it runs from here, yeah. it goes in, and all the way to your collarbone. But then it hangs outside here, and then they sew it. Yes. Well, that <laughs> sounds painful too. <laughs> it was. But then no it makes your life easier, because the chemo now will not burn you. I can only imagine the effects. What were the effects to your body? <sighs> chemo didn't hit me as much as radiation. You did radiation as well? Yes, later. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh, we did radiation. But for the chemo, just sitting for the eight hours and then getting the, the nausea from, I couldn't eat. In fact, I came to eat rice, colored rice that is yellow or the, the peas, mm -hmm. almost a year and a half after I left India. Because anytime I could see the yellow rice, reminded you of? Yes. My, I could get nauseated immediately and just try to hold a table beside me. Yeah. It was like my body was being taken back mm, to I being understand. in the hospital. So what happened that you had to do radiation as well? Hmm. So I thought, ah, six months is okay. I'm just going to be strong and mm -hmm. deal with the six months. The 12 rounds are supposed to be for six months. Got it. So two every month. Got it. After the six months, I had to wait one month to do a PET scan. Yes, to see how you're doing. To see if how it's I'm cleared doing. from your system. Uh -huh. mm. The doctor said the tumor has now reached eight centimeters. You can't go home with it. Yeah, that's still big. So it's what size big. was it before? It was around 14, something like that. It was big. So the, the, the chest pain was because the tumor was pressing my mm, heart and lungs. lungs. Yes, it was growing, but then it was because tumors are not painful. Mm. They are painful when they start pressing the, the nearby, the, the neighboring organs. So now to get rid of the eight centimeters mm -hmm. left, what was required, what was needed to be done? I had to do radiation, 17 of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think because I was not prepared, that was the hardest treatment for me. Really? Yes. Because I, I feel like I was rushed into the treatment. Mm. 
you know, they, they, they take you to this um, sort of a table with the CT scan to put marks on you, the tattoos, and then fit that suit. And then you have to be sort of, not really sort of, but you have to remove all the clothes mm. before around six people, people. Most of them, all of them were men. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. For them to put marks and, and place that mask on you so that, and they're telling you, make sure you are steady. Because if you move, the rays are going to hit another wrong part. Place. Yeah, so we need to make a suit that yeah. <laughs> make sure you're this. So it, it was, I cried mm. when I went for the fitting. I, I went home and actually cried. And also that meant more money. So we had spent a lot of money for mm. chemo and even rent, rent for that house. It was, it was a cheap. two-bedroom. Mm -hmm. I see. Fully furnished, so we had to pay rent. Wow. We had to pay chemotherapy sessions. And after that, now you, you are being told, come up with around, was it 400,000 wow. for the radio? Wow. And you see, you have to do a down payment of half of it before treatment begins. I see. And you see, you, now you're telling people back at home who had thought we are nearing the end of mm. this whole thing. Then again, they have to More come money. up with all this money. So this took a toll on your family financially, of course. It did. And my siblings sacrificed a lot. Mm. They did, yes. Because that treatment, I didn't sit down and do the math, but it wasn't less than three million or four million. Wow. It wasn't. And nobody has that money lying around for it's such an emergency. Or for, for such an emergency. Of course. Yes. Of course. So they, they did sacrifice a lot for me. So the radiation, is that what did it what what were the effects of radiation on your body? I couldn't eat properly. Anytime I was trying to eat. I could close my eyes because it was painful. You feel there are razor blades on your throat. Mm. You, food can't go down, water can't go down, but you have to eat. Yeah. I remember, in fact, for chemo, anytime I was trying to lose weight, I, I used to work out a lot. Mm. I could still work out with chemo. And anytime I lost weight, I was being told, if you don't eat, we are going to feed you with tubes. You have uh -oh. to eat. Uh -oh. Chemo is... It, it, it's going to de it's it's a, it's going to take a toll on your body. Yeah, you, have you have to, to eat. eat. You have to feed well. So I was on this. I have to wake up with certain fruits, a protein powder. After two hours, I eat wow. this. After another two hours, I need to eat. Even if you're not hungry, mm. I have to eat because yeah. I was naturally small-bodied. Okay. So I had to eat. What were your coping mechanisms during these treatments? I mean, that's a toll on your body. Mm -hmm. How are you coping? Distracting yourself or mm -hmm. helping you stay positive? How are you doing it? Meditation. Yes, I started meditating around 2015. Okay. So during that time in 2019, by the time I was diagnosed, it was something that I used to do. Got so it. I could sit down and visualize my body healing and me getting better and I am back home with my family and that could keep me going. Got it. And even when I was receiving the chemo, I was visualizing how it is dealing with the cancer cells mm. and it just makes you naturally calm and you are trusting the process. Mm. Yes. And apart from that, I, I had to become spiritual and religious. When you're going through something, mm. it's, I, I always put it like it's like a ship. A ship, when it docks on the, when it's docking, they have to run an anchor down. Mm. If they don't, then the ship is going to go offshore. So what you I'm saying is... You have to find is, your anchor. Yes, you have to find your anchor. Okay. If you don't, it's going to be extremely hard. Difficult. Yes. We had people there who knew that they were quoting the Jeremiah verse, that oh. God has plans for you, not for evil, but for good. Yeah. So that would get them through, that whatever is happening, that God actually a knows purpose. Mm. Yes, how my life will turn out. What was your anchor? My anchor was, of course, I, I believed in a sort of way that even now when I'm going through something, I always try to see what is the universe trying to teach me? What is the lesson? I look for the lesson okay. and try to learn it. Okay. And during that period, I found my lessons. You did? Yes, I did. Number one, I don't think I was a good friend before I was diagnosed. Okay. But my friends really came, came out for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I even had one of them travel to see me. They oh, lived wow. in, in nearby, but around 18 hours wow. from where we were. But they came? Yes, he came to see me with his cousin, and it, it, it was amazing. And I saw how much they, my friends really cared for me. Mm. And I sat, I sat back and said, what kind of friendships have I been nurturing? I, I'm the friend who, maybe if someone has a wedding, I'm like, okay, here's my contribution, and I, I don't show up. I see. But after that... It challenged you? It, it did challenge me, because okay. I saw people 
come through for me for no other reason other than pure love. Oh. And that's how it should be, isn't it? And that's how it should be. Love should be the one thing connecting us. Mm -hmm. um, as you finish this part, um, I saw a new story you shared with us. You said, you've been mentioned now, throughout the whole journey, you try to hold on to what you'd normally do, staying healthy and exercising and working out. And of course, your family would be like, ah, ah you know, mm -hmm. slow down. Mm -hmm. Even I'd imagine if I have a patient, I'd be like, take it easy. It's supposed to be resting, you know. Um, but you said you will stop when your body tells you to stop. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. How do you know when it's good for you or when it's too much? How did you find that balance? At first, I didn't. I wanted to be like, you know, I, I have to be this. You're pushing yourself. Yes, I have to push my body. Yeah. I can do this. I'm yeah. amazing. I'm a strong woman and yeah. all that. And something funny happened. Mm. I had finished working out. I started meditating. And then I fell asleep on the floor. I didn't know. My brother just came and said, hey, you fell Good asleep. Morning. You, <laughs> you were meditating, but you just fell asleep. Uh -huh. So there was that. And I could get gaps in my mind. Mm. I could sit with you, you are talking, and then my mind just you goes blank. Out. I don't hear you. I, see. I don't know where I am. Oh, wow. People call it the chemo brain. Got it. You don't even know where you are. I see. But later on, you're like, oh, I think I zoned out. Mm. Yes. But a good reminder of your human. Yes. I think you're pushing yourself to be, and it's good to encourage yourself and want to beat this, but you're human end of the day. Mm -hmm. So it's fine mm -hmm. to be still. <laughs> and rest in that period that is true that is true and during radiation i couldn't exercise oh, I you know, see. people think that chemo is hard but my treatment radiation was tougher chemos are different yes. yes but mine was easier radio was tougher mm. it would only take me 20 minutes but when i come home i literally could not do anything the time. i had to sleep for six seven hours during the day okay i had to sleep i couldn't work out. I couldn't do anything. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. On that note, we'll take a short break. When we come back, you can tell us about the community mm -hmm. you had while you were in India. Yeah? We'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, so, Usna, you can tell us about the time you were there in India. You had a community of people, sort of like a support group, where you walked with each other. Tell us about how that was and how it helped and impacted your life. It had a great impact because I, I think I lived a very sheltered life from childhood oh. of just staying in the house, you go to school, you come back to the house. Okay. So I didn't have that great sense of community. But then being there, we had to be there for each other because yeah. the, this, this is a Kenyan, this is a Kikuyu, this is a Meru, you talk Swahili. Yeah. And that community keeps you going. But then here's the issue. Mm. If one of them has an, a problem, mm. then you have to come together. together yes yeah. you know the way at home we have the maybe someone has passed on and yeah. then you go to that house mm. and you worship together yeah. Yeah. you give you give some condolences and all that that also used to happen okay. yes and remember this is a patient who you've had the same doctor with mm. you maybe even had chemo in the same ward and then they pass on and then you have to be there what is the, the most difficult part of that journey for you I tried blocking it I didn't want to feel because I thought I have to be strong and being strong is, you know, don't, don't, don't feel this stuff. Yeah. Just don't feel it, okay. right? I didn't process any death. Really? There was one that knocked me off guard. But before Which that, one? I remember mm. in a period of around three weeks, we lost seven people. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we had to go and sit with their caregivers. They are crying. And mm. the one who has passed on is your friend. There are people who even attended my birthday. Our, our landlord could just make some cakes and we could come together. There was juice, biscuits, and we celebrate, yeah. just something tiny and we laugh. It brought some sense of belonging yeah. when we were there. Yeah. So I never tried to process any death because mm. I think at the back of my mind, I knew if I did that, I would break down. I was, it yeah. would make me face reality that this is actually what cancer is. Not what you might be thinking of it, but this is what it is. It is a a very, it's a disease that's not something to joke around with. It's fatal. Yes, it's fatal. Thank you for that. It's fatal, actually. So. But it happened. But it happened. What happened? So I remember. Why did this particular one affect you? It was a two-year-old boy. They used to live upstairs. 
and my brother used to carry him to the playground. They were friends, the parents were young. And there we were. Their dad had come back to Kenya. And then he tells me, my son passed on. And I called him and asked him, what are you talking about? Mm. The son had done a stem cell transplant. Mm. So he was still in the hospital. When, you, when a stem cell transplant is done, you have to stay in the ward for a month, two months, three months even. So you be yes, before you're released. And I remember their grandmother was there with uh, that baby. We had taken one vehicle to get her to the hospital two days, three days before, and she had told me, I've bought this little air airplane for little Taji. So there I was being told that the little boy had passed on. And then my mind did what it had always done, Which is? block. I tried blocking it. So I went to the sitting room, I went to the sink there, there was a, a kitchen. And my, I told my brother, hey, by the way, Taji has passed on. Of course he was shocked. Yeah. And then my, my friend had come to visit me. They were there, you know, boys just talking. And then they started saying the word chemo. For some reason, it triggered me. And I told them, please don't say that word. I, I don't want to hear that word. And innocently, he said, what's wrong with chemo? I'm just saying chemo. I felt this energy rush through my brain. I don't think I've ever felt anything like it. And I immediately let out a very sharp scream. I went to the bathroom, sat on the floor, and I was holding my, my head like this, screaming and heaving. So my, my, my friend was coming asking me, what's wrong? Breathe. I couldn't breathe. I was gasping for air. Just doing, <gasps> I could not breathe. I cried. I cried so much. And my friend was there really soothing me. I wanted to, to, to see, doctor, yes, the psychologist. And he told me, that is an anxiety attack. And it happens when you don't process emotions. There is only enough that your mind can handle. Mm. If you keep, keep, it inside. keep it inside, keep it inside, your mind has to let it out. And that is its only way because you don't want to, to think about the stuff yeah. that's going on. You don't want to talk. Yeah. So it has to do the job or by itself. Wow. Yeah, so it forces you to let everything out. How are you today, um, three years later? Mm -hmm. How is your health? How are you feeling mentally, emotionally and physically? How are you? Amazing. Oh, great. I feel amazing. Great. And I you do have a glow about you as well. <laughs> Thank you. I go for my scans and I call them like they are my licensure for living, being renewed. Uh -huh. Yes. So all the scans are perfect. I'm like, yay. Amen. My license on earth has been reviewed. Amen. What am I supposed to do? I need to meet a friend. Way back, I used to think I don't have to meet my friends. I don't have to do this. But now if my friend wants to see me, I'll tell them, okay, let's set a date and I'll appear there because I don't know what tomorrow will look like. Nice. What, is, what is the plan for Usna? What do you have in store for the world? Right now, I'm a stress management trainer. Oh, yes. look I, at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I also have a podcast called Fantastic. Mastering Your Happiness. Oh, great. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm really working on letting people enjoy life right now as it is because we always have the notion that if this happens then mm -hmm. i'm going to be happy then exactly yes exactly like happiness is reserved for a smarter version of you yeah. which is more accomplished yeah, more beautiful more. but yeah. it's not okay. it's really not it's now and it's we now decide to do it now right now because if you think about it Every single thing, before you had this goal right now, maybe mm. it's to build a house, you yep. had another goal that you thought was going to make you happy. That's true. Before that, there was another. Yeah. There'll always be something There'll always be something. Trying to achieve. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. So if you put your happiness there, you will never achieve it. Mm. Yeah. So where should you put your happiness? I think happiness comes from within. That's true. Just really within. And when someone says within, it sounds so abstract. Mm -hmm. well, what is within? Yeah. Right? Tell us. But then for me, I think of it like we have people who are religious and they believe in God. Yeah. That is actually where happiness comes from, Amen. just within and sitting in silence with God and in those conversations. Yeah. Because when you talk to someone, they tell you, there's so much going on in my life, but deep down, there's a peace. There is some peace. That is the peace that we look for, Amen. thinking that accomplishing goals or being healthy will make you that mm. happy. But then I had to realize, if I'm waiting to get better to be happy, mm. look at this little boy. He just passed on. He didn't do anybody no wrong. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't even deserve this. Yeah. But then he left. So which makes you think, 
those who stay are not perfect. They were not strong in any way. That little boy was not stressed. He used yeah. to love around. Yeah. And you have to realize that maybe everyone has their own map. That's true. Their own life. journey, their own yes. path. Their, their own path. Yeah. And you just have to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Every single little thing. I can sit on, uh, in a grass field and then the, the air, when it's just pushing these blades yeah. side by side, it makes me, it warms my heart. Oh, that's lovely. And that for me, that's the peace that we actually look for and think that we can get it out there, out there, out there. So okay. I believe it comes from within. within. And most of us don't even know what peace looks like mm. because we've led busy lives, chaotic lives. You don't know, what does peace even look like? Okay. Yes. So that's why I say I really advocate for people who spend time with God. Yeah and in church, mm. just even people who go to church on Tuesdays. My yes. sister does that. When there is nobody, there is no preaching. Okay. You just go and you sit in silence. You spend time with God. Yeah. It gives you a certain peace that you will never get out there. Peace is a, that surpasses all understanding. That's exactly, That's exactly. True. Others do meditation. I start my day with meditation. I have to get from, I operate my day from that point of mm. knowing that deep down, I feel at peace no matter what is happening. These are just life matters that are always there. Kilometer or nazo. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. But I'm okay deep down. What can you tell someone at home watching who may have gotten their cancer diagnosis or may be in treatment and it's difficult? Like you mentioned, it's not an easy journey. Mm -hmm. How can you encourage them today? Get a community. Okay. Go online. Search on Facebook. I searched for Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the cancer that I had. Okay. There was a community there. Even when I was being given a treatment uh, protocol, ABVD, mm. I just typed in ABVD in the group and so people, so when something comes up, you already know, ah, this is the, this, these are the symptoms, Got these it. are the side effects and I all see. that. I see. So get a community. Okay. Otherwise, it's a lonely place to be in because nobody understands. You know, you are facing literally death. Mm. It's a matter of life and death. You have no idea. Cancer is not, you can't be told that, yes, you're going to be okay. Like who, when maybe you are having a surgery, doctor like, yeah, we'll just remove that. You're going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. No, even now I still go for scans okay. because they can't tell you, you're okay. You're doing great now. Go on with yeah, your life. Even in remission, not. you have to go and check. You have how to you're still doing. go and check how your body is doing That's so true. that they can catch it in time. Yes. In case they find it. Got so it. if someone is going through it, find a community. Your friends can be there, but they don't know what to say. Yeah. They don't know. They're not going through <laughs> it. They, they can't even understand what you're going through. So they're going to look at you with sad, soulful eyes. Mm. And that's not what you need. You need warriors. Okay. Yes. And I remember there was this saying that the only person who knows how much water is needed to put out a fire is someone who has put out that same fire before. I see. They will tell you, you need 50 buckets. Okay, that's how we do this. That's how we are going to do this. In fact, if you could tell us as we finish, how speak to cancer patient caregivers. Like you said, we, we may not know what you're going through, but yeah. how can we best be there for you? You don't want the sad eyes, you don't mm -hmm. want the pity. Mm -hmm. How best can we walk with you? For me, when I saw my caregiver happy, that's when I was happy. Really? Yes, nobody wants to feel like a burden to someone else. Mm. But when you feel like they're getting some type of improvement, they're doing something on their own okay. while being there for me, that will okay. make me happy. I like that. As a patient, you want to see your caregiver okay. Because otherwise now, you have to hide so many things from mm. them. You, you feel don't like, want to affect yeah, them. Yeah, I, I don't want to affect you. Let me just deal with this. Oh, no. But if my caregiver is happy, I'm happy. Because it's already a huge sacrifice. So it doesn't hurt you if you see them happy and they're like, do they even care about me? No, uh, absolutely no. not. He left his family, his wife and kids, to be with me in India for nine months. Imagine. He was That's not obligated to. Yeah. Yes. It's already a huge sacrifice. True. Yes. Thank you for that tip. As we finish, you read a hundred books, or thereabout, while you were in India. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can end for us a show with something that stood out. It could be your favorite quote from one of the books, or something that spoke to you that you can share with us. One of them was, you are the placebo. Okay. Yes, Tell us it's more. by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Okay. So there's this, a placebo is like an experimental drug. Yeah. Let's say they want to bring a drug to the market, then mm -hmm. they have to make something with sort of a sugar pill yeah. and try to see if, is this drug working mm. or do people just think it's going to work? Yeah. 
So it was done with uh, Panadol, and that was not to bring Panadol out, mm. but not really Panadol, but a painkiller, paracetamol. paracetamol. So they were trying to just show how the placebo works. Okay. So they divided two groups of people. One group was given the real painkiller with paracetamol. The other one was given something that looks like paracetamol, but, but it's isn't. Uh -huh. It's just a sugar pill. But here is the issue. Mm. Both groups got better. Ah, mm -hmm. it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. So your mind knows, I've taken the drug, I I'll should be get better. better. And that's why sometimes when you know, when you realize you're sick and you didn't know, that's when the symptoms show. That's when the symptoms show. Uh -huh. Yes. Because in your mind you're like, oh, I'm sick. I'm yes. supposed to. Yes. But this one, they're like, oh, I've taken the medication, I'm healed. So it goes deeper in just really telling you that most of the things that we are manifesting in our outside world yeah. yes they start in your mind mm. and just really dr joe's books have helped me to understand he's a neuroscientist so it. helps you understand how the mind connects how it works and here's the best one that thoughts mm -hmm. are not what is happening in reality mm -hmm. they are just neurons that have connected from your childhood for example mm -hmm. right now if someone walks in and you're like i don't like that person you don't have any evidence on who they are yeah yes. you don't even know them you don't know them yeah but it's because maybe they remind you of someone from your past but you don't know they remind you of anyone yeah but your mind just does the connections mm. if someone doesn't pick your call you think to yourself they must be assuming my call they must not like me but you've not had a conversation with yourself That's so true. It's understanding that your thoughts don't necessarily mean that's what it's is not happening. Reality. Yeah, not they're all the reality time. all the time. Yes. Okay. So right now, when I'm having all those thoughts and just the monkey mind running around, I just know there are thoughts. It doesn't mean that's what is happening out here. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. Quite inspiring. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for bringing a breath of fresh air here today. We wish you all the best. We wish you all the very best. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And to you at home, I hope she's inspired you. I definitely have been inspired today. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you and have more of such conversations. Until next week, take care of yourselves. God bless you. Take care. And of course, special thanks to Steakout Restaurant on Manyani Road here in Lavington for hosting us. Next time you're in the area, do come by. But until then, ciao.